And once again, and um, it's very happy today tonight uh, to give you some sharing and of my experience of management of uh, facial pain from the original point of view. So thanks a lot, uh, the Dental Association, in particular Dr. Zhang and Dr. Ryan Jay for inviting me to have this opportunity to share with you. And uh, I'm not an expert on uh, facial pain, but I do want to share with you some cases, some real cases uh, to you tonight uh, on some common differential diagnosis when management on the facial pain. So um, let me skip these introductions. So uh, the definition of facial pain would be very simple. It is actually uh, any kind of facial or oral facial pains. It refers to any kind of pain in the area bounded by the eyes and the lower mandibles, including the oral cavity. So uh, actually the epidemiology in internationally uh, actually is a common complaint. It is the population preference of around 1.5 to 2%. Uh, risk factor have shown that the women are more frequently affected in the ratio of 2.1 comparing with uh, gentlemen. The risk factor includes uh, psychological factors, a low social economic status, smoking, and the presence of other chronic pain conditions. So actually, uh, any kind of structures in the head and neck regions can provoke facial pains. So not just only the facial regions. And in fact, it is a common problem which is faced by a lot of different specialties. It's actually uh, multi medical and paramedical disciplines are actually facing a lot of facial pain in the clinical practice, including dentists, ophthalmologists, psychologists, ENT colleagues, and all of us uh, medical colleagues, in particular neurologists and neurosurgical colleagues. So I don't waste a lot of time. I think, I, I think all of you are familiar with uh, the differential of uh, facial pains in your perspective. It includes uh, temporal material disorder, dental pain and disease of the oral mucosa and the cervical gland disorders. And not just not to um, forget uh, the ENT causes of facial pains, including uh, rhinosinitis, and also the facial pain uh, encountered by uh, ophthalmologists, including an acute or close angle glycoma or optic neuritis. So um, from a neurological, neurological points of view, I will elaborate uh, with some real cases to you, but this gives you uh, overall uh, differential diagnosis of facial pain when you face a patient having this problem. Uh, we have to differentiate it into a neurological type of pains. Trigeminal distribution of a neurology is common. As all know, uh, trigeminal neurology, a uh, rare type of glossopharyngeal neurology, and also post-hepatic neurology. Headache is also a common complaint faced by us. And indeed, some rare cases of uh, chronic headache, including uh, TAC, which is a very common kind of uh, chronic headache. Uh, I will elaborate it by cases later on. And migraine, not to forget migraine, which is the commonest cause of chronic headache. Some subgenic headaches and facial pains, and also not to forget the central cause of facial pain, including optic neuritis, uh, which can be an early presentation of multiple sclerosis, and a new one that is opticus. And I have a case sharing later on with you as well. And not to forget multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis and also any central post stroke pain. So stroke is, um, so facial pain is a rare presentation of stroke, but we do see do see some rare causes of stroke, such as dissection, where patient present first as a facial pain. Uh, vasculitis in an old gentleman, uh, one of the um, common examples, including giant cell arthritis, is also can be a rare cause of facial pain in, uh, in our field. So approaching to facial pain, I think all of you uh, should take a very good history and examination, including the time yeah. reset, the duration, and the porosity. The it's location of the radiation helps us to find the exact nerve distribution of the pain. Uh, quality and the severity, the aggravating factor and the relieving factors. Say, for example, uh, speak, chewing, uh, brushing, any cold street foods, whether you provoked or aggregated pains is also important. So other pain conditions, including uh, pain conditions such as headaches, migraines, or fibromyalgia, and also not to forget uh, whether this kind of pain has uh, what affects the patients. Say, for example, the mood, uh, the sleep quality, and the quality of life. So first of all, uh, the neuralgia cause of pain. So this is uh, showing the trigeminal to fifth nerve distributions. Uh, yes, as you all know, uh, we have three main branches from the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic branch, the maxillary branch, and the mandibular branch, mandibular branch. 
So uh, trigeminal neurology is actually divided into two types. The first type is a classic type of trigeminal neurology, where the patient presents as a shock light, electric, abrupt stepping kind of pain, which is the hallmark of uh, type 1. And Tau or burning pain can also uh, pre in absence or less than 50% of the time when the patient experiences this kind of pains. So some of the patients with a type 1 of uh, trigeminal neuralgia can actually progress to type 2. So what is type 2? And patients still experience this kind of stepping sharp light pain. Uh, but this uh, typical hallmark of stepping pain or dull pain or burning pains is actually uh, constitute more than 50% of the time. And while the constant background of pain was so significant attribute with the absence of any structural abnormality. So, and you can say that trigeminal neuralgia is a test of definitions that, and it's the only kind of asymptomatics. And we must need to rule out other structural disease before we are saying that there is no other structural cause to explain the trigeminal distribution of pain. So what is a secondary trigeminal neuralgia? It's actually some kind of mass or lesions having a uh, causing demyelination of the trigeminal nerve. So this is uh, one example, and uh, the reason why you are doing an MRI and also imaging of the vessels, because a uh, neurovascular context is uh, common, actually, as a cause of trigeminal neuralgia. While we have proven that uh, for uh, patients with trigeminal neuralgia, when they have a structural cause, most of the time, the neurovascular contact is actually caused by an artery rather than a vein. But does it mean that means that uh, the neurovascular context uh, equals to the clinical and uh, clinical pictures of trigeminal neuralgia? So uh, this paper illustrates that actually, in actually, uh, the preference of a context between a nerve and a vascular is very common in trigeminal neuralgia patients. For patients having symptoms or not having symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia the neurovascular context is actually a uh, very high preference on both, both of the uh, sides, whether they are having symptoms or not having symptoms at all. And so the context of a neurovascular, the contact between a nerve and a vessel is not actually, uh, definitely leads to the clinical diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. What is actually important, we need to take into the contact, whether it is having a uh, shifting on the uh, vessels and also atrophy of the vessel is more important. It, it, it needs to take into the account. And it's actually, it had been said that only on imaging, if the imaging shows that the trigeminal atrophy has a light tools, that it can be a benefit for any surgery to be done. So this point is very important. So when you're facing patients with a trigeminal neuralgia, you really need to take in the pictures of the imaging to see whether there is any imaging evidence of atrophy of the nerve and also dislocation of the nerve before you can say that whether their surgery have a, um, any kind of benefit to this kind of patients. So uh, I try to show you this imaging. So I got this impression from my radiology colleagues. Uh, sorry, I cannot bring you a pathological uh, picture. This is only showing you a very common condition when we order MI and MA on patients. And radiology comments on that. There's context actually between, if you can appreciate the two black dots. Oh, sorry. Remember, the nerve and the vessel are black on the T2 imaging. This is the coronal nerve cut. It's actually very common to have contact between the vessel and the nerve. But you can appreciate that in these pictures, there is no HOV. And there is also no dislocations of the trigeminal nerve. So we con cannot conclude that this kind of contact can be cause of the pain in patients. And definitely, if the patient does not have the typical uh, trigeminal neurology kind of pain, we should not have surgery on this field. So uh, I don't have any time to elaborate the, uh, any, the use of the medical treatments on trigeminal neuralgia, in particular the use of neuropathic agents. But if patient presenting with trigeminal neuralgia, if they fail uh, two to three kinds of neuropathic agents or distraction to the quality of life, we usually refer to a neurosurgical treatments on, so for the relief of pain. So uh, the surgery is actually done uh, 
uh, by new surgical colleagues uh, for, for relieving of the pressure between the pulsar tire vessels, as I mentioned, to the arteries, which is pressing against the trigeminals, which is causing the irritable pain to the patients. But to bear in mind that there is a risk of microvascular decompression, say for some infections, and a risk of hearing loss and facial numbness as well. So this is another kind of a common cause of facial pain. I think you will not miss it. It's a softer actual patient present with a weird feeling of the ear and also facial pain and then later development of a typical rash along the distribution of the nerve. So the pathophysiology of the softer is, um, a, is actually the rest of softers uh, latent in the dorsal column, but whenever patients present with a low immunity and uh, they will have the attack. And actually, uh, one of the common complications of a uh, uh, saucer, and particularly in the elderly persons, is a post-hepatic neuralgia, which happened in uh, more than 10% per, of all patients and over 50% of patients more than 70, 70 years of age. While patients with a typical uh, burning, aching sensation of the affected dermatome, uh, which can persist um, week, months or weeks or even months after the best basal lesions of shingles are resolved. And they can, there are actually various kinds of neopathic agents which can be benefit to them. To them. So this is a typical rash uh, development in other dermatomes in patients. Uh, the second category for uh, facial pains we usually face off is the primary headache disorder. I would like to share with you uh, two examples. Now, this is case uh, I, I see a few months ago. Actually, it's a lady, 18 years of age. Uh, she's actually planning to have a DSA examinations in coming May. Uh, when I first saw her in uh, uh, December last year, her headache character is that the headache is actually characterized in the calendar days for any kinds of chronic headache. So she has quite disturbing eight to 10 days uh, per month um, headache which is disturbing her life, disturbing her studying life in the past two years. She complains of uh, eye pain, in, in particular uh, unilateral most of the time, which is pulsar dilatation and associated with either nausea or vomiting. So this kind of a headache attack increased in the, in the previous few months and actually related to stress and the irregular sleeping pattern and the Zoom lecture due to COVID. And it's actually the headache disturbed the patient's life a lot. So uh, she was actually using a lot of uh, uh, analgesics, panel extra, NSAID, and tryptin for the acute kind relief. So this kind of pain is actually typical of migraine, which is more than 10 calendar days per month affected. So I, start, I tried to start her on some uh, primary line of prevention therapy, but unfortunately she failed to uh, first line preventive therapy. Uh, she failed in treatment due to drowsiness, it's affect her studying a lot, and she cannot tolerate Indra, which is one of the first line uh, preventive treatment for migraine as well due to the low side blood pressure. So in this stage, what can be offered to these patients? It's actually uh, some uh, introduction of migraines. It's actually a very common primary headache disorder. And it's also a leading cause of clinical disability. And it actually happens more than 10% of the populations, more common in women than in men. And uh, typical headaches is actually in the lateral pulsar tile. And the quality of a headache is moderate to severe intensity, while it is aggregated by the physical activity associated with the nausea, photophobia, or phonophobia. So uh, typically, there are four stages for a uh, typical migraine onset. While the prodrome pubis, patients usually miss and they have some food cravings, nastiness, and mood instable or fatigues several hours or even days before the development of headaches. And one third of a uh, migraine patient, they may have aura. While the most common aura form is the visual disturbance. Other kinds of other patients may complain of some dis disturbance in the skin sensation or tingling sensations. While all patients will have at the third stage, which is the typical headache stage. Out this typical headache stage will, uh, will be a typical uh, headache description, as mentioned before, unilateral, flopping, and aggregate by the routine physical association associated with nausea or vomiting, with the features of allodynia as well. After this typical headache, which happens in few hours to few days, they will have development of a post uh, syndrome. While they mood is affected, the concentration and they have fatigues and also food carving as well. So you can imagine that uh, typical four stages of a migraine actually affect patients' quality of life a lot. 
So for acute treatments, uh, we must deal with the acute phase as the pain, as headache is uh, actually having uh, quite disturbing to the quality of life. And not to forget the reason for prophylaxis treatment because too frequent acute headaches actually leads to a lot of chronic problems or medication over headache or analgesics overuse. So we have few treatments. Uh, the aim of acute treatment is to stop and to reduce the severity of the, uh, severity of the attacks and to make the quality better. And it actually should be offered to all patients presenting with migraine. While prophylaxis treatments, as I said, is uh, the aim is to reduce the frequency and the severity and duration of migraines. So when the patients have, uh, theoretically, if the patient has more than four disturbing headaches per month and or risk of medication overuse or actually having a lot of disability to the quality of life, it is a must to consider preventive therapy uh, for them. But actually, the use of prophylaxis treatment is actually uh, depends on patient to patients. So this is the common uh, primary headache or primary preventive therapy available in primary care for patients with uh, episodic or chronic headache. Beta blockers, antidepressant, anticonvulsants, ARB, uh, CCB are all available first-line treatments for prevention of uh, migraine patients. But there is a comment that uh, always patients will have a poor uh, adherence. It's a major factor because <laughs> um, each kinds of um, migraine prophylaxis treatment is not specific for the headache itself. And they have a specific and or, or generalized uh, uh, side effects, which patients cannot tolerate. So usually patient compliance is not good. So what can we do if we face with patients with a prophylaxis treatment who fail uh, first line, either one or two uh, prophylactic treatments. So what can you do to them? It's the development of a CGRP antibody, monoclonal antibody. So what is CGRP? It's actually proven that the CGRP is actually involved in the pathophysiology of a migraine attack. So whenever migraine attacks, the CGRP serum level will be elevated. And uh, some experimental and uh, has also uh, proven that the CGRP infusion will actually trigger the migraine-like headaches. So whenever drugs which are antagonist to this CGRP receptor or to the CGRP itself can actually effectively treat migraine itself. So currently available and um, prophylaxis CGRP antibody, monoclonal antibodies, there's so far three available in Hong Kong and the fourth is actually coming uh, um, in a very short time. And, and Neuromat, Venonusumab and Gansalusumab. So they are all injections. They are neither injected every one month or every three months. So what can CGRP done on what is the benefits of uh, CGRP monoclonal antibodies to patients with a chronic migraine? They can actually uh, prove that the days of a migraine headache, no matter the severity, and also the days of the migraine headache are decreased with a long-term use of these monoclonal antibodies. They actually, they have a prevention for patients presenting with an episodic migraine to prevent their progression to a chronic migraine itself. So these patients start to use uh, one of a common monoclonal antibody starting in January disease, and the typical migraine headache days it actually decreased to two to three days, uh, comparing with eight to ten days before the injections. And when we will her in February and June, her, uh, her actual day of uh, headaches actually decreased a lot. And also there is a much decrease in the days of use of NSAID per month per cell. Uh, she don't need the use of triptine, which is an acute treatment and uh, a specific treatment for acute attack of migraine. She tolerate the injection of this monoclonal antibody well with no side effect. She just finished the DSA examination and still continue to use an enrollment. And she can take off amitriptyline, which caused a lot of side effect to her previously on high dose. So this is another case of headaches. It's a gentleman of 30 years of uh, age. Uh, she he actually complained of severe facial pain lasting one to two months. So uh, and whenever headache develops, she has a few episodes per day and lasts several weeks. And the, the interesting thing for this headache is that it's kind of headaches in a custom period. It happens every 12 to 18 months in his life over the past five to 10 years. It is just like a cycle. And whenever this, this attack is usually lasts for several weeks, the pain is so severe that can only be relieved by triptins, which can be used in migraine headache as well. So um, 
uh, from this history, you, you will think that this might be another case of migraine. But actually, when you mask more the characteristic of this headache, the patient described to me that uh, pains actually located around one eye, typical regions, with a dripping of, and swelling of the eyelid. And also, there is tearing and congestion, congestion as well uh, on one side of the pain. So I cannot show you the patient pictures. He actually showed me uh, how he is looking to me. This is just similar to this, just much swelling of the mucosa, swelling of the upper eyelid, and also red eye and nasal congestion. So this is actually all kinds of autonomic symptoms during the attack. So what is this? Actually, this is a trigeminal autonomic capillage, TAC, which is one kind of a primary headache disorder. Uh, the classification of TAC is uh, complex, but actually it based on the duration of symptoms of the headache itself. It's most common is cluster headache. I must say cluster headache. Uh, rare type, the soon cat, which is the short lasting neurological headaches with conjunctival injection and tearing. It's a rare form of TAC as well. So all kinds of headaches underneath TAC only occur in the first distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So those some of the cases can occur in the second or third division as well. So typically they should be associated with a permanent uh, autonomic symptoms. So whenever, and, and as, as actually a peak in the patient's third to the fourth decade of life. And male has actually have a predominance of TAC or cluster headache. So whenever you feel this middle-aged gentleman having a recurrent cycle of headaches, do ask them for any typical autonomic symptoms associated during the development of headache. So what is sun cat osuna is actually a, in, a typical conjunctival injection tearing, which is short lasting and unilateral. The pain usually peaks within seconds of attack. It actually lasts in few seconds to few minutes per episode. But as some actually uh, it lasts five to six attacks per hour and even 10 to all. And I have seen one, it actually has 20 to 30 attacks per hour, which is very disturbing to patients. And most of the pain distribution, as I said, uh, develop along the first distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So cluster headache or cluster headaches is another differential of a severe ulateral facial pain. It's underneath the category of TAC as well. So this is a longer attack comparing to soon cat. So each attack lasts for a few hours and a less attack per day comparing with sun cat as well. So uh, some of patients is actually misinterpret this as a dental cause of facial pain. So what is the typical treatment for TAC? For acute treatment, uh, patients know that uh, they have to admit to the hospital because hospital can apply a rebuffing bed, a very high oxygen inhalation to them. So a typical relief of the headache will usually occur within five minutes when you start a very high concentration of oxygen. If the patient cannot go to hospital, uh, they can try triptin or in or NSAID. In particular, the, the one of the first generation uh, NSAID inomethacin. So this is not a randomized control trial, but it's actually uh, well used by a lot of uh, physicians, which is proven to be benefit for them. So uh, it summarized the three main causes of time headache disorder, the migraine, the tension type of headache, and the cluster headache, uh, the distribution of the headache and the duration of headache and the association factor uh, for the aggregate factor and the relieving factor for each kind of headache are present in this table. So what is the central cause of facial pain? If the reason to have central cause of facial pain is that any kind of lesion along the ascending pathway of the trigeminal nuclear or any damage to the cervical sp spinal thalamic pathways or the cortical processing areas will pre present, patient will present as a facial pain, which is central cause. So what is uh, some common uh, categories under this category? So this is a 40 years old young gentleman which show a lot with no vascular risk factor at all she suddenly developed a typical vestibular symptom with a neurological facial pain and neurological ataxia on examination. My like examination saw a uh, Horner syndrome and ataxia on one side. While an MRI brain done acutely show an acute infarct over the medullary events. So you may wonder why this patient we have stroke, he, he has no vascular risk factor at all. And at the same time, the angiograph on this patient show a typical features of acute dissection of vertebral artery. So you wonder uh, why this patient have this kind of stroke in a young age without any kind of vascular risk factor. On more detailed history, she actually complained to us that she has a neck manipulation for a therapist a few days ago. Uh, this neck manipulation actually involves a neck twisting and also locking uh, for the neck pain. 
just few days before the patient developed this kind of typical symptoms. So possible cause of VA dissection besides a net manipulations, I have seen some patients with a uh, wrist occupation when patient in uh, uh, involved in painting when they're using a ladder and then they look over the ceiling for too long and doing some yoga, judo or wrestling, we have a, a risk of injury to the neck. And also brain trauma, if the patient suffer a uh, severe neck injury, suffer severe car accident, well, they have a sudden cause of flexion and extension of the neck. It's actually another cause of risk factor for VA dissection. So uh, the facial pain is usually on the same side of the dissection of the of sudden onset. But uh, besides facial pain, usually patients will have other neurological symptoms or signs, such as you will find nystagmus, truncal attacks here, or internuclear opomopedia, which is a typical eyesight uh, specific to brain stem lesion on this patient as well. So this is another case, uh, interesting case I see a few weeks ago. And in clinic, it's uh, actually a young lady. Uh, she enjoyed good past health. She has quite typical uh, upper respiratory symptoms one week before visiting me. Her RAT himself at home is negative. But she, unfortunately, she complained of a sudden onset of very severe eye pain with blurring of visions just after the subside of the respiratory symptom. Uh, I was referred by the opomony colleagues, and she mentioned to me that this patient's girl is actually having quite severe papillary edema of one eye. So I arranged a mission on this patient with an MI brain orbit and an angiogram with venous system all turned out to be negative, at least reassuring that this patient does not have a mass lesion in the brain. The, all the blood are actually unremarkable. The VEP, which is the visual evoked potential, uh, was actually prolonged, meaning that the optic nerve is actually having some delay in transmitting the signal from the optic nerve to the retina. I do a lumbar puncture to her. It shows an increase in the white cell count, 20, which is lymphocyte pre all pre lymphocyte predominant, and the PCR test of the meningitis and cancrovitis panels are all negative. So what is this diagnosis? This is a very typical uh, optic neuritis. And currently this patient is pending another two common uh, antibody, which can be one of the subset of uh, optic neuritis. And she was managed with uh, intravenous mifepanosolo in view of the disturbing uh, eyesight due to the optic neuritis. So what is uh, optic neuritis or pneumatis optica animal? It's actually one of the inflammatory central nervous system disorder, which is distinct from multiple sclerosis. And most of the patients with animal actually have a serum antibodies, target attained to acropoin 4, which is the APRP4 immunoglobulin G. And this acropoin 4 antibody is very highly specific for clinical diagnosis of pneumatis opticus. So what is the core features for uh, pneumatis opticus? Patients can present as optic neuritis, acute myelitis, or post syndrome, while patients will present with unexplained hip cause or nausea vomiting. They can have an acute brain cell syndrome, and they can have some uh, acute diencephalon kidney syndrome as well. So uh, animal disease tends to be more dis. dis abling than multiple sclerosis. But for acute treatment, you usually use a high dose of mifepanosolone as a first line. If patient fail or remain static uh, after the use of steroid, we need to proceed patient to a plasma exchange when they are refractory to IV steroid. So recent observations suggest that and actually the earlier use of plasma exchange add-on with a steroids is actually associated with a lower long-term the, uh, disability and a higher proportion of patients will actually a complete recovery as well. So for animal disease, uh, besides the use of acute therapy in acute treatment, usually they need to use a long-term disease modern therapies uh, in the future of the life, and namely consists of a uh, low-dose penicillin or MMF, azathioprine, or any kind of B-cell depression agent. So some more cases for you. Uh, this is the case uh, seen in outpatient clinic as well, which is the rare cause of facial pain as well. This is uh, a quite old gentleman. She has, he has actually a subacute onset of facial pain and muscle pain. And he, he is a very sporty person. He plays a lot of sport, hiking and playing tennis. But in the recent two to three months, he mentioned to me that she has very severe muscle pain and stiffness. And the pain mainly low, low and also there is pain located in the scalp region around the knee and the facial region. So, uh, Distributes of weakness and pain stiffness are most, mostly 
uh, concentrate on the girdle region, the upper limbs, and also the pelvic region, which lead to stiffness and weakness and cause a lot of distress and pain to this gentleman. And examination on him and the butt taking show a very marty elevation of ESR and CLP with an anemia and also reverse albumin and globulin ratio. And uh, we need to rule out that this is truly a myositis. So we take the CK level, which is normal, and we did the nerve conduction test and also the EMG study to make sure that the nerve and muscle are performing well. So what is it? Actually, this is a case of uh, temporal arthritis and polymyalgia with medical as well. So this is actually uh, one of the medical emergency, which is which can lead to blindness in this patient because uh, what is temporal arthritis is actually an inflammatory disorder, a giant cell arthritis affecting the medial size of the cranial arteries. If you leave it alone, patients can have severe headache, scap tenderness, jaw collocation, and will ultimately lead to eye complication as well. So the clinical features when they chew, they have the pain and also they have unilateral headache and diffuse pain around the ear. And typically, we need to do arrange a Doppler sound, ultrasound to see the typical skip lesion. And some patients will proceed to a biopsy as well if ultrasound did not show a, a typical lesion. But if clinical support, this clinical diagnosis after exclusion of, of other possible causes, we may uh, delay the use of the biopsy because we will strictly go on to the treatment to save uh, the, the prevent the life-threatening cause of visual loss. So um, supportive features include elevated ESR, CLP, anemia, and the presence of scap tenderness and also tenderness over the superficial temporal arteries, which they are all clinical features supportive of a giant cell arthritis. While treatment has to be prompt, and this patient usually treat with uh, high dose penicillin for relief of symptoms. So progress on this patient, his, his muscle pain and the eye pain markedly decreased after a few days of high dose steroid. And currently, uh, she is on a tapering dose of steroid. And it regained his previous ambulatory with a vision improved gradually as well for my ophthalmology colleagues. So uh, this is another rare cause of facial pains as well. So this patient actually is a, a elderly person. He has a right facial pain, which is disturbing her as well in the last few months. And this looks like a trigonal neuralgia initially because he said that the pain is actually increased by chewing, cold or wind, which actually fulfill the textbook features of uh, trigonal neuralgia with all the features of allodynia and hyperenergesia as well. But uh, one thing worrying is that he has quite marked decreased sensation over the V1 and V2 dermatome of the trigonal nerve, which is quite atypical for trigonal neuralgia. Typical is said that uh, this sensation should not be lost in patients with trigonal neuralgia, only the kind of pain and allodynia, while other cranial nerve examination are unremarkable in these patients. And, but uh, strangely, uh, his MRI reveals that uh, actually this is a very large axial mass compressing on the pons and the rib in the in the brain stem. And actually the right sex nerve cannot be, be seen. Uh, though this patient's sex nerve uh, did not affect the clinically, uh, his MRI did show that the sex nerve on the right side is actually uh, compressed as well. So for abdusal nerve, which is a uh, uh, which is one of the common uh, nerve responsible for eye movement, which is responsible for abduction of the eye. And this cause of the nucleus actually located in the pons up to the level of the cavernous sinus and they innervate the lateral rectus responsible for abduction of eye. So a uh, five region of uh, cause we have to rule out when we're facing with a patient clinical present as a sex nerve palsy. First of all, it's the nucleus itself. The second level is the cisternal portions. Uh, 30 is the duronal canal, which happens in this patient. And the fourth common, at the, and the other common place of effect is the cavernous sinus. But cavernous sinus patients usually present with multiple cranial nerve, nerve as well, not just the sex nerve. And lastly, the orbital portion. So, uh, so in summary, after presenting several examples of facial pain, and I think uh, facial pain, when we face with a facial pain, as I said, is uh, have a lot of uh, variation, lot of symptoms. We need to take a very detailed history and a physical examination when we see patient presenting with facial pain and try if possible to narrow down the possible differential diagnosis. Uh, try, I try to use this table as an example to show how to how can we face or assess a patient present with a facial pain in order to help to narrow the differential diagnosis and to have a better uh, narrowing of the possible cause of facial pain.
also, and I hope you uh, enjoy the lecture and I welcome any questions afterwards. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm.